interest group. Uh, so th many thanks to our colleagues there, some of whom are here today. Um, and a five-year research program, uh, uh, which is called MUS AI. So you hear me speaking about that uh, quite a bit. And that's an acronym for the full title of the program, uh, which is this, Music and Artificial Intelligence, Building Critical Interdisciplinary Studies. Now, Mars AI has a website uh, that's here on WordPress for those interested to go and see what we're doing. And we're now two years in. Uh, and if you want to dig around and see the full scope of what we're doing, please, please go to the website. Uh, I want to gratefully acknowledge the funding for the Mars AI program by the European Research Council uh, Advanced Grant Scheme and Mars AI is based in UCL's Department of Anthropology and the Institute of Advanced Studies at UCL, with close links to the Max Planck Institute for Empirical Aesthetics in Frankfurt, with whom we're collaborating, the Music Department of King's College London, and with some funding too from McGill University and Myler Quebec's AI Institute, uh, both in Montreal. Most of all today, I want to thank in advance uh, two people who've made the whole thing possible. Um, our Mars AI administrator, Elul Bombachi, who's sitting there. Thanks so much, Elul. And from the AI and Arts Group, Lele Demetsi, who's online helping us. So um, here is the full picture of the 10 research projects making up this program. Um, and the one we're presenting today is just the one at, towards the bottom there in blue highlighted. And you'll see the range of quite different perspectives we're taking in building critical interdisciplinary studies, including ethnographic studies of AI's impact in the Middle East and West Africa, interdisciplinary collaborations on key topics like music genre and recommendation, our topic today, creative practice-based research, studies of the cultural economy of AI music startups, and studies of creative labor and musician engineer collaborations, and not least studies of generative music. The second seminar on February the 6th at InSpace in Edinburgh with speakers Eric Drott and Chris Howarth uh, and myself, will air our collective work on a very hot topic music and copyright after generative AI. And we're going to be taking social, legal, and ontological perspectives on that hot topic. Uh, so today we have three speakers, myself and my colleagues, Fernando Diaz and Jenny Judge. And we'll speak uh, all together for about an hour. And then we welcome Q&A and discussion. Uh, we have to end pretty sharp at 4.50 because we have to all get out of the room, uh, the building by five, I'm told. We'll take questions from the room first, and then those attending online can post questions in the Zoom chat. But please, those of you online, wait to post your questions till the end so that we don't miss anything. Now, for those who are interested in uh, following up, there's an academic paper setting out the work we're presenting today, which is just about to be published in the ACM journal, Transactions of Recommender Systems. And it's available uh, to download on the event page uh, for today, Eventbrite page for today. So please go and uh, download it. Central to the work that we've done are two postdocs who aren't here with us today. Andres Ferraro, who's now working at Pandora, and Gustavo Ferreira, who is lecturing at McGill. So we acknowledge with enormous gratitude their contributions to our work. So I first want to talk about the wider research program. You know, why this program? Why now? And here's the rationale. As you're all aware, you know, growing amounts of academic and policy work is happening on the social and ethical implications of AI. But a couple of years ago, at least, 
it was clear that no major research initiative yet uh, concerned itself primarily with AI's cultural implications, of course, currently exploding around generative AI's implications for creativity and cultural production. In this context, the Muzz AI program takes music as a medium through which to create a field of critical interdisciplinary studies examining AI's influence on culture. Now, although music and AI have a long and an evolving historical relationship, and we look at that in our program, uh, and there are, there's a lot of money going to practice-oriented AI music, critical research on AI music is at a pretty early stage. And we also consider that critical perspectives are crucial to seeding new approaches to design in this space. So to do all this, we uh, consider that new approaches are required that cut across entrenched disciplinary, methodological, and epistemological divisions. So Mazai as a program supports computer scientists to hold rich and sustained interdisciplinary dialogues with social scientists, humanists, musicians, and artists. And our aim is to prototype new forms of what we're calling radical interdisciplinarity for AI music and more broadly for the digital humanities. And in the second stage of our program, which begins this autumn, we want to feed our work into new experiments in this radical interdisciplinarity in new AI pedagogies and trainings at the graduate level. And we welcome any of you who'd like to join us in this adventure. And that's the topic of the fourth seminar, the final seminar in our series, which is March the 1st here back again in this room. So I mean it, please get in touch if you're interested in that. Uh, and now to today's topic, okay, which is our recommender system project. Um, and this is the title of the paper that we're publishing shortly. And as I said, there are four authors, Andres Ferraro, Gustavo Ferreira, Fernando, and I. So as you all know, uh, personalized recommender systems have become the dominant means today of curating cultural content. And they implement, we shouldn't uh, uh, neglect to observe that they bring a higher degree of automatized intervention than previous forms of curation in the way both individuals and communities encounter cultural content. Now, despite their intended personalized address, Recommender systems, of course, have cumulative effects in shaping the wider cultures and societies in which they're being employed. Yet current research and the industry debate neglects these cumulative influences that are happening both across user populations and, of course, over time. So I'm going to give a brief overview now, and then I'll be deepening a discussion on a number of these issues. So it's in this light that we introduce what we call the commonality metric, we'll explain much more about it, to measure the degree to which a recommender system enables a given user population to have a shared experience of specified cultural content. And with reference to normative principles, ideals underlying public service media systems, we identify in particular universality of address and content diversity in the service of enhancing cultural citizenship as relevant goals for recommender systems delivering cultural content in democratic and cosmopolitan societies. To achieve content diversity, we propose a model of human editors accountable to larger value communities as a way of defining these categories that go into this uh, curation in the service of cultural citizenship. And in the work, uh, Fernando in particular will describe this, we empirically compare recommendation algorithms using commonality with existing utility, diversity, novelty, and fairness metrics. And we find that ours complement, complements these existing metrics, suggesting the utility of such alternative non-personalized interventions in recommender system design.
So uh, I'm going to repeat a little bit of that. We open the paper with these four sort of foundational propositions. First of all, we say, recommend a system design should move beyond a purely commercial orientation focused on personalization. It should pursue complementary design paradigms guided by normative principles intended to promote the democratic development of contemporary cultures and societies as this enhances human flourishing. In other words, what we're talking about here is AI design oriented to the public good or public interest. And we feel there's too little discussion of this as yet. Second, as I've said, we need to acknowledge the cumulative influences of recommender systems, extraordinarily powerful influences which mediate wider cultural and social changes. And we do this so as to develop ways of intervening and modifying these influences in hopefully progressive ways. Third, as a concrete means of advancing these ideas, we turn to evaluation metrics as a good way to incorporate alternative values in design into recommender systems. And then we conducted experiments to assess the usefulness of commonality in the context of related metrics. And fourth, we were looking for interesting and productive normative principles. And in the end, we turned to normative ideas underlying public service media systems, principles that could then be translated into our quantitative metric. And employing research on principles uh, underlying uh, public service media systems, we note both the powerful insights to be gained and its limitations in terms of the challenge of translating earlier normative ideas into digital platforms. And I mention this because it's a telling kind of problem for the PSMs themselves. We can come back to that. Now, one of the most interesting things has been that we've elicited very serious interest in our work from the BBC, from the Canadian, the Quebec equivalent, Radio Canada, uh, and most recently, uh, possible interest from the Danish uh, equivalent, DR, and the Australian, ABC. So this is really an interesting vein that we seem to be hitting. But we want to insist that there are much wider implications. We don't want to be confined to PSM. That isn't what this is about. Because the, the kinds of ideas we're proposing could animate a body of public good and public interest work on AI design by a range of institutional forms, by nonprofit or indie or alternative or grassroots initiatives. Yeah? So we're not proposing this as simply, merely a kind of idea to be picked up by the BBC and the like. I want to talk about our method now, because this idea of a radical interdisciplinarity has been so central to what we're doing, and I think still rather rare and very much uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, courtesy of um, the extraordinary funding uh, from the ERC. So our research process consisted of sustained interdisciplinary dialogues between two computer scientists who've been involved in research on recommender systems, Fernando and Andres, and two scholars with expertise in digital media and public service media from the social sciences arts and humanities, that's me and Gustavo. And over the course of a year, we instructed each other, COVID times, all on Zoom, in appropriate background research, sharing ideas and deepening our mutual engagement in both directions. And in this way, we translated terms from one side to the other, while of course responding to critical questioning about key ideas, concepts and adapting those ideas. Now, such translation across disciplinary domains may be difficult, it certainly is, and is bound to be incomplete. Yet our experience, we hope, will convince you, is that it produces hybrid thinking that can be very generative and produce powerful new concepts and tools. So such sustained systematic interdisciplinarity moves beyond the tendency for one domain to provide merely a kind of service to the other side, right? 
And if you're interested in that idea, then I've co-edited a book with Andrew Barry called Interdisciplinarity a decade ago. We did research on interdisciplinarity, and these are ideas in that work. Please go look at it. So one of the forms of interdisciplinarity we identify is a service subordination mode where a bunch of disciplines are kind of the master disciplines and they bring in, they kind of, you know, sort of bus in a bit of sociology, a touch of anthropology, a touch of literary theory, whatever it is, just to add that kind of social or cultural colour. And we're trying to do something quite different, yeah, a different kind of engagement. And what this more equal, flatter and more immersive engagement we think we want to propose enables is a kind of reflexive critical thought on both sides that can build towards innovative syntheses. And in talking this way, it recalls a debate happening out there, uh, which some of you may, may know about, which calls itself values in design. It's in STS, kind of borders of Kai, STS and others. And values in design affirms this kind of interdisciplinary translation process while cautioning in interesting ways that the translation of normative principles into formalizations, into computer science terms, will inevitably entail reduction and abstraction. So if we accept that, and we have to, then the question becomes which reductions and abstractions can be tolerated while retaining and upholding core dimensions of normativity. And I'm sure we'll uh, talk about that later. So in passing, I wanted to gesture towards the work of Phil Agre that some of you will already know, a kind of dissident within AI research who's been long been referenced by figures trying to do the kind of work we're doing. And his famous paper, Toward a Critical Technical Practice, and he gives us a kind of manifesto, highly reflexive manifesto for what he calls the reflexive work of critique. And I won't go through this whole slide, but you know, he talks, <laughs> he talks about being led into full-blown dissidence within the field of AI uh, and it having its own particular cognitive style and the culture of AI research. Um, and uh, there are marvelous outtakes from this paper. He says, you know, it was really difficult to start learning other disciplines on their own terms because my training had instilled a single mission, transforming vagueness into precision through formalization. Love that. Uh, but he goes on, you know, AI's construction of itself as a self-contained technical discipline is a powerful force for intellectual conservatism. Critics will be asked, what's your alternative? within a tacit system of discursive rules that rules out alternatives from the start. AI's intricate, largely unconscious cultural system ensures that all innovations are enmeshed in traditional assumptions and practices. So the final quote I like very much, he says towards the end of this paper, critical practice is essential to make sense of such things, but its goal should be complex engagement. It's a nice term. A critical technical practice will require a split identity, one foot planted in the craft work of design and the other foot planted in the reflexive work of critique. That seems to me very resonant with what we're trying to talk about. So in the remaining time, I want to fill in uh, more about the architecture, the normative architecture that we worked up to do this translation work into design. And it took us on a kind of journey through a set of principles broadly associated with the history of public service media. Um, and this is sort of the beginning of it, perhaps the most encompassing idea. And it's the idea of cultural citizenship. And this idea has been proposed probably in the last 15 years or so as a kind of fourth stage of citizenship in citizenship theory. And as uh, to quote a writer on this, a striking feature of recent political discourse is the increasing confluence of culture and citizenship. Um, 
And what cultural citizenship recognizes are the profound social transformations wrought by globalization, migration, decolonization, the growing heterogeneity of nation states, and the intensification of identity politics among subaltern and marginalized groups. And in light of these profound changes, cultural citizenship draws attention to a new domain of cultural rights involving the right to symbolic presence, dignifying representation, and the maintenance of distinct cultural identities where such cultural pluralism enriches the fabric of society. To promote cultural citizenship, PSMs and other democratic and public interest channels of cultural production and distribution, we might say, have a responsibility to curate a plurality of content in order to stimulate intercultural and intracultural exposure and dialogue and respect for cultural diversity. Now, of course, music has always been a kind of particularly significant, even a privileged medium for experiencing cultural diversity and can thereby act as a particularly interesting means of enhancing cultural citizenship. And in my earlier writings in a book called Western Music and Its Others, I write a lot about the forms of identification with others that music engenders in us. And these ideas about cultural citizenship are written up in a couple of papers of mine from uh, some time ago, if you're interested to look further. So let's look into this idea of universality of address or commonality. This is about the public making qualities of shared cultural experiences. So PSM was always underpinned by this principle of universality. Uh, the idea was that it should disseminate content that both reflects and caters to the cultural and social diversity of cosmopolitan societies, while also enhancing unity through the creation of what we might call, for want of a better term, a common culture. And I'm going to cite several key writers just to bring this home to you. Stuart Hall, a marvelous statement. He says, the quality of life for black or ethnic minorities depends on the whole society knowing more about the black experience, best access through black cultural production, music, film, rap, literature, art, and so on. Or we could take Bhikkhu Parekh or James Tully, both of whom write about mutual cultural recognition and the expansion of cultural reference being essential to the well-being of pluralistic societies. But, as they say, this doesn't obviate the need for integration through the provision of common experience and the fostering of common identities, thereby enabling and gendering hybridities uh, across social and cultural boundaries. Or we could take Nancy Fraser in her famous commentary on the public sphere, dissolving Habermas's unitary idea of a public sphere and her idea of the existence of plural counter publics and subaltern public spheres, but which she says must be accompanied by a more comprehensive arena in which members of different publics talk across lines of cultural diversity. Or we could take Michael Warner in his wonderful book, Publics and Counterpublics, in which he writes about shared cultural experiences that they generate a sense of publicness, of the experience in common with others, of cultural experience in common with others, with whom this can be enjoyed and debated. Uh, cultural experience in common is generating a social imaginary. So I want to say in light of this kind of battery of work that cultural experiences should therefore be and are often collective, not just individualized. And of course, as people who love music, we know this. And music does this with particular potency, generating what I've called in my writings, musically imagined communities. So after all this, I would just add that such effects, as I've spent five minutes discussing, are attenuated by recommender system personalization. And our commonality metric we propose might help to recreate some kind of universality of address 
in the curation of content by recommender systems. So how do we conceptualize this much vaunted diversity in our work? So if diversity of common cultural experience is a precondition for enhancing cultural citizenship, how should we conceptualize diversity? Although concerns about personalization often center on filter bubbles that keep individuals in taste echo chambers, we want to go further. We're concerned not only with the effects of individualization, of course we are, as I've just indicated, but with the need for greater diversity in the curation of cultural content and the benefits of promoting a shared diversity of cultural experience. Now, the two most obvious vectors of diversity in cultural production and distribution are content diversity, usually expressed in some version of range of genres or range within genres, and diversity of source or producer, where greater diversity of producer is likely to favor, but of course it doesn't guarantee greater diversity of content. And now on source or producer, the various biases shown by the underrepresentation of cultural content with respect to gender, race, class, and region, that is diversity of source, of course corresponds to wider core periphery dynamics and to geographical inequalities in the cultural industries. So it's no surprise that recommender systems tend to mirror these inequalities favoring Western popular culture often in the English language and generally from major producers. So increasing diversity of source where content comes from as an issue of equity and as it bears on diversity of content is therefore absolutely crucial for recommender systems oriented to enhancing cultural citizenship. And in our work, we test commonality, this metric, with three categories of underrepresented source in three media, the media we look at uh, are music, film, and literature. And our three categories of underrepresentation are female and non binary producers, independent production, and non Western sources. That's what we sort of took off the shelf to try out for our metric. But we do more in our work because one of the things we are very concerned with is the risks of essentialism and reification in the cat categories of content and identity that we might uh, address in uh, uh, boosting diversity. So we want to propose uh, the crucial role of human editors uh, and of course, as we all know, recommender systems are human, non-human assemblages or socio-technical systems in the STS uh, jargon. And as Nick Siva reminds us, there's always a human in the loop. You just have to go looking for that human. So there's nothing new in that, but we want to go further. So in order to avoid essentialism and reification as much as possible in the classificatory judgments of content, and source diversity, we advocate human editorial processes that draw on communally validated classifications, taking in the subtleties, both of demographic categories and of genres. And we suggest that the role of human editors is to reflect on the diversity of a recommender system with respect to given categories by drawing on insights generated by a larger value community, knowledgeable about relevant cultural expressions, their demographic basis and their genre designation. So if you like, this is proposing a sociologically normative model of judgment. Uh, and by value community, we're referring to communities generated by shared cultural passions interests and identifications, among them genre communities, who embody an evolving consensus about these interests and their relationship to categories of social identity and about which members have varying degrees of expertise. So our human editors act as conduits for these larger communities of interest and judgment, 
uh, as one of our reviewers said, these are consumer communities, fan communities, if you like. And their judgments are legitimized and validated by this relationship. Of course, this has resonances, we realized, with the participatory turn in AI design, though we aim not just to empower stakeholders in that parlance, but to hone and legitimize editorial processes and judgments in the curation of diversity. So I'm going to hand over to Fernando, who's going to give the next perspective. Thank you, Georgie. Um, this has been a really fantastic collaboration. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the um, or the more algorithmic computer science side of things that we worked on in this uh, collaboration. Uh, there will be echoes uh, from what Georgie presented earlier, and that's that's intentional. Um, that sort of demonstrates uh, the conversations that we're having and how the translation actually happened uh, between the two uh, disciplines. So to start, what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, recommender systems uh, and really situate them in, in, in computer science terms. Um, and then I'll be digging down into the evaluation metrics. Uh, so recommender systems are, are uh, a relatively young technology. So originally presented in the 1990s, here I have an email uh, from the recommender systems listserv where they originally presented the term recommender system. Um, is, uh, is something that was developed in the 1990s, uh, really emerging from a, a research area called collaborative filtering, which really has to do with learning about uh, how to recommend items based on the uh, shared patterns between groups of users. Now, um, the methods and evaluation that uh, underlie recommender systems, especially today, uh, really it can be traced back to uh, a lot of the concepts from a field called information retrieval. And information retrieval, for those of you that are not familiar with it, is a uh, field that sort of dates back to the 1950s. Uh, is kind of a convergence of library science and, and computer science, and really underlies a lot of the technologies that uh, power uh, search engines these days. Uh, and at a very high level, uh, the recommender system task or the uh, information retrieval task is presented in this last bullet. Uh, which is given some information about the user. In the case of search, it's a keyword query. In the case of recommendation, it might be the previously viewed or listened to items. Sort an entire catalog of items in decreasing order of relevance. Uh, uh, essentially uh, allowing you to navigate that, that catalog in a way uh, that is most relevant to your particular tastes or information need. Um, now, the algorithms that uh, power recommender systems uh, really underlie uh, a couple of different technologies that you might be encountering these days. Uh, so first and probably most visible are uh, platforms. Uh, so you have uh, streaming music platforms, streaming video platforms, uh, news, uh, news publishers, audiobooks, games, etc. All have these giant catalogs of items uh, which, when you approach the system, are ranked or sorted in some way. Um, and so that's pretty visible, and that's oftentimes what we talk about when we talk about recommender systems. Um, there's a second uh, place where recommender systems emerge, uh, which is a little bit less visible. Uh, but the same sort of ranking is happening. Oftentimes, exactly the same algorithms are being used. And these are things like uh, navigational technology. So driving directions are oftentimes presenting to you a ranked list of possible itineraries that you might take. Predictive typing, uh, when you're typing in and they're uh, completing your, uh, uh, your sentence, oftentimes you'll be presented with a series of choices, even though the, uh, the suffixes that are presented to you are essentially generated, they're ranked in some way. And that ranking is based upon the same technology that you have for personalization, et cetera. Uh, 
Again, you have to squint a little bit, but uh, if you look at the algorithm behind the scene, it's essentially exactly the same thing. Um, and so, like I said, you know, sometimes these things are recognizable uh, and uh, oftentimes they're embedded into these larger systems. Now, even when they are recognizable, uh, as in the case of streaming music platforms or streaming video platforms, um, recommender systems or the algorithms underlying them are embedded into um, a set of interconnected, interconnected models, technologies, and people. So here on the left-hand side, I have a sketch of um, what a social media platform might look like. Uh, this is a, a graphic by uh, Christian Lum and Tomo Lazovic. It was presented earlier this earlier last year, uh, uh, describing essentially Twitter, right? So you do have some component of the system that it, that is your classic recommender system algorithm that you might learn in uh, an introductory machine learning course. Uh, but alongside this, there's all manners of model that are detecting, say, bots that are approaching the system and classifying the text in different ways, uh, people that are involved in developing the policies that are uh, that are uh, guiding the recommendation algorithms, interface uh, designers. Um, and then at the end of the day, also the user. So even though oftentimes you talk about the algorithm as this one thing that's powering the technology, it's part of this giant network of other, um, of other systems. So when we talk about uh, intervening into recommender systems and, and aligning, the, aligning them with public service media principles, um, we can and should intervene uh, not just in one particular part of the system, but across the entire system. Because uh, if, we, if we focus on one, one component alone, it's possible that other components are gonna be actually more problematic than that one that we're fixating on. So what are those things specifically that we could, we could intervene on? Uh, in a recommender system, in a classic recommender system uh, case, you have the catalog of items. So what songs make it into the catalog, which ones don't? Uh, you can say the same thing about videos. What are the policy decisions that are being made at the, at the organizational level for what gets included? How are things recommended? What is not recommended at all? Um, interface design decisions. So am I dealing with rankings? Am I dealing with grids of images, uh, grids of uh, items? Or am I providing the user with uh, some sort of explanation or uh, some sort of ability to adjust the recommendation algorithm? You can think about intervening on the algorithm itself uh, by adjusting the weights of a model, for example, data annotation practices. And then finally, the thing that we're gonna focus on today is uh, the metrics that guide a lot of the design of these algorithms or these recommender systems. Um, so let me talk a little bit about what I mean when I, when I talk about evaluation metrics. Uh, so evaluation metrics, also known as key performance indicators, are these quantitative measures of some property of the system. Okay, and that property uh, can be anything from uh, the number of users that are coming into the system, but at the end of the day, it's, it's some measure of quality usually. So uh, it's, it's some way to put the model on a scale or that system on a scale and say, well, it has this number and therefore it has this quality of, um, of service. Bigger is usually better. And uh, examples here might include uh, a measure of the average time across users on the platform or uh, across a variety of different uh, media formats, the number of cl completed tracks or videos uh, or other, uh, other, other consumable media or number of clicks. So all these things are proxies for this idea of quality that you might measure in a production uh, recommender system. Now, these evaluation metrics play uh, a really fundamental role uh, across a variety of different dimensions in, um, in the world. Uh, so primarily uh, from a machine learning perspective, increasingly modern machine learning algorithms can directly optimize these things. So I if I have some quantitative uh, notion of good uh, that I can feed into uh, say a reinforcement learning algorithm, it can directly optimize for that notion of good. And uh, you know, if I trust that notion of good, then sort of hill climb towards uh, a better system. Secondly, um, in the research community itself, oftentimes uh, recommender systems or any machine learning system uh, is, is defined as state of the art if it increases this quantitative metric. Um, in terms of companies in the corporate setting, I make decisions about which algorithms to actually launch into production uh, based upon evaluation metrics. 
you might have heard about A-B testing. A-B testing is essentially looking at the, at the um, value of those metrics for two different experimental conditions and then opting for the one that is essentially better uh, subject to st statistical analysis. Um, bubbling down into the uh, corporate organization, these evaluation metrics are then used to evaluate not just the performance of the company, but individual teams in the company and individuals within the company. And so these evaluation metrics now start to have, um, have impact on the livelihoods of individuals, their careers, et cetera. Stepping outside of the company, uh, uh, a large branch of auditing of systems, say for algorithmic bias, rely upon uh, the development of uh, evaluation metrics. If you've heard about fairness metrics, this is, this is where they might pop up. Now in recommender systems, I wanna sort of uh, split apart two different types of evaluation metrics uh, that we might be uh, measuring. Uh, so the first one that I've been alluding to earlier is something called an online metric. Uh, so this is essentially something that you might be measuring while running the system itself and presenting on a dashboard uh, to all of the different decision makers. So uh, these are oftentimes based on real user behaviors. So number of clicks that the user is presenting to you, uh, streams, shares, likes, uh, that sort of thing. Um, now, uh, designing a system or experimenting with a system based only on online metrics can be a little bit risky, as you might imagine. Uh, so first, it's relatively slow. If in order for me to uh, test the hypothesis about a particular system, I actually need to present it to the users, wait around usually two weeks to see how the aggregate metrics are actually changing. Uh, as a result, because I have to present this in front of real users, there's some risk if I, if I launch some suboptimal algorithm to those users, especially in high stakes situations. For this reason, offline metrics are often used to uh, measure the quality of the system uh, in advance to, of an online launch. Uh, so one way to think about an offline metric is as a simulation of what the users would be doing if I were to put the system in front of them. Uh, so the way these things work is you build a statistical model of the user basically. And, and then um, because I have this model of the user, I can run it offline uh, faster than real time and iterate on model development. Now, of course, this is an approximation for real user behavior, which is itself is an approximation for quality. Uh, so it's subject to, to a lot of error. So it's not the final decision about what's, what's good or what's bad. So the structure of these offline metrics can be decomposed into different, two different parts usually. One part is the mathematical model of user behavior. Uh, so this will be sort of the uh, functional form of the model saying like, how does a user actually examine these ranked list of items? What's a, the what's a probability that they're actually gonna click on specific items? And then second component being the data that is supporting that modeling. So this is usually labeled data from some set of annotators that can be in tandem with the, uh, with the uh, mathematical model be used to do the simulation of the user interacting with this uh, recommendation decision offline. Now there's of course uh, a bunch of human decisions that are involved in the design of the, these offline metrics. Uh, as I mentioned before in the mathematical model, I have to pick the functional form of the model. I have to pick the parameters of those models. Uh, in terms of the data, uh, I have to design the labeling instructions and then the labeling instructions themselves are subject to interpretation uh, by, uh, by people. So we wanted to take this approach of uh, measurement and evaluation metrics and, and translate this notion of commonality into a, a quantitative metric. Uh, and so the, the core question here was, can we integrate these principles from PSM uh, into these existing uh, ways of measuring performance. Now, I do want to point out uh, a couple of different caveats that uh, Georgie alluded to earlier, which is that um, first, uh, the metric design, uh, even outside of the context of, of PSM, is iterative. Like when we design an evaluation metric, it's never the end of the story. We're always iterating on this thing, improving it, uh, subject to what we learn about people, what we learn about how systems work, um, and how the world changes. So uh, the evaluation metric that we developed, uh, even though we spent a, a long time developing it, is still a draft, it's still an experiment. Now secondly, uh, and this is uh, uh, something that Georgie was alluding to too, um, that these metrics, as you already can see, carry a lot of very strong assumptions about, um, about how people behave, what they're interested in, um, and uh, 
again, we want to do what we want to do here is to iteratively relax those strong assumptions, um, subject to the conversations that we've been having, what we learn about the world, et cetera. So um, now stepping over to how we actually do the translation process, uh, in order to measure commonality, we need two different things, right? So one is some way to uh, specify what is the type of a common experience that we're actually after. And then secondly, how do we measure the degree of that shared common experience? In terms of the type of common experience that we might be uh, after, again, um, uh, as Georgie described, uh, we have these categories that are uh, determined by human editors uh, who are accountable to a larger value community. Now this is important because it grounds this common experience in a very specific type of diversity, uh, which, is, which is not necessarily the case in, in other existing uh, uh, diversity metrics or fairness metrics in the recommender systems community. Now, secondly, um, the degree of shared common experience uh, is where we pivot to a lot of the mathematical modeling to uh, build a model of uh, not only how people are engaging with the recommender system decisions, but also on measuring the degree to which everyone is sharing the same uh, experience, right? And this, this notion of everybody uh, sharing the same experience, of the public sharing the experience is different from uh, what you might get if you just say, okay, I'm just looking for the majority of people looking, uh, uh, having a shared experience. Uh, it's a relatively simple mathematical formulation to do this, uh, but it's, it's uh, within the context of recommender system design, relatively uh, controversial. Um, so of course, uh, there, are, there are existing metrics to measure things like diversity in the recommender systems community, um, but they're usually uh, motivated a little bit differently and as a result, uh, measure something different. Um, so notions of diversity, especially in uh, production systems, are oftentimes geared towards the end of revenue. I care about diversity because it's gonna retain users, or I care about diversity because it's gonna reduce cost. Uh, secondly, uh, diversity is usually within a specific user's recommendations, right? So I care about diversity within a specific user, not necessarily to the end of a shared experience across users. And a lot of these same uh, comments can be extended to uh, fair recommendation, which is an uh, active community right now. Um, so we did do um, some uh, empirical analysis of, the, of these commonality metrics across three different data sets, uh, music, uh, movies, and books. Um, and, and primarily we did this to, to validate the metrics, look for good metric properties that we might have, what we, what we might want in uh, an evaluation. So we have high, uh, what's called convergent validity, so validity, which means that the uh, commonality metric is correlated with these, these things that we believe are, uh, uh, it should be correlated with. So diversity and fairness metrics, it has some correlation there, even though mathematically they're measuring different things, statistically they're, they're similar. Uh, it has high discriminant val validity, which means it's not similar to some things that we expect it not to be similar to. So commonality is not correlated with personalization focused utility metrics like um, precision at K or something else like that. Uh, finally, uh, commonality it has relatively good uh, robustness to label noise. So as you recall, we have these human editors that are providing us with labels and um, obviously they can't uh, they can't label everything, and so how robust is that metric subject to the constraint of the, of the editors not being able to label, label everything? And we, we notice that the um, commonality is relatively robust. Um, so I didn't want to go into any of the technical details of, 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 this, of this work. You can find it in the paper. That said, we have a couple of different directions we can take moving forward. Um, so first, uh, as I mentioned, we focus on an offline metric here, uh, and uh, a little bit better would be to look at online evaluation metrics because you, you remove some of that approximation that I was referring to earlier. So we're currently in ongoing conversations with a few different PSM organizations. Uh, secondly, uh, we'd love to validate commonality with respect to longer term user behavior. Uh, so the idea here is that we want to improve uh, commonality and common diverse experience to the end of longer term user behavior. Uh, we can't measure that necessarily offline. How can we do that in an online system? And then finally, as I mentioned before, metrics are just one place in which you can intervene into a recommender system. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different other parts of the system that you should be engaging with in, uh, and that, that uh, we, we want to explore next. Okay, with that, I will pass it off to Jenny. Hi. 
Hello? No. Uh, Can you try it again? Uh, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Oh. Yeah, I can just. Can you hear me? Am I very quiet? I'll project. Okay. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will start by saying a little bit about how I fit into this whole story. Um, I work at the, what is these days, an increasingly chaotic intersection of philosophy of mind, philosophy of AI, and aesthetics. Um, and I'm particularly interested in music. And I met Georgina last year when I was commenting um, on a presentation that she gave on music recommender systems um, at the Institute of, uh, for, uh, of Ethics in AI at Oxford. And she kindly invited me to participate in this project. And today I'll be providing a perspective from philosophy in particular on the project that um, she and Fernando have been presenting. So what I would like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is to pick up on some key ideas from Georgina and Fernando's paper, soon to be published paper, which, you can, which um, both of them were mentioning just now. And I'd like to expand on these ideas a little bit by drawing on resources from philosophy, so contemporary and historical philosophy. Um, so Georgina and Fernando draw our attention to uh, several problems with personalization, um, insofar as it's the dominant paradigm of uh, recommender systems. And in particular, they urge us to think about the aggregate influence of um, personalization across populations and also over time. But they point out that it's not enough just to you know, sit around making critiques. Everyone's a critic, as they say. We also have to think about what values recommender systems should be optimized for. Um, and we also have to think about how recommender systems can actually be redesigned uh, so as to do that. And I think, uh, incidentally, this kind of combination of uh, criticism and construction uh, is what is really unique and exciting about this particular project that Georgina and Fernando have. Um, so on both of these fronts, Georgina and Fernando argue that recommender systems should fo foster cultural citizenship. This should be one of the values um, that recommender systems should be optimized for. And they introduce their commonality metric as a kind of a practical intervention that is aimed at helping, helping out with this ambition here. So what I want to do uh, in the next few minutes is, first of all, I'm going to expand a bit um, on one particular problem with personalization, which is the problematic way that recommender systems right now model the individual listener, the individual listening subject. I'm going to say a bit about what's going on there and why I think it's problematic. And then secondly, I'm going to say a bit more about why it is that music uh, is so well placed to foster cultural citizenship. Like, what is it about music that makes it so powerful here? Um, and, you know, I mean, talking a bit about that second point will sort of hopefully mo motivate you to think, like, look, this is why music recommendation really does have to be done carefully and responsibly. Um, and throughout, I'll kind of refer to Spotify's recommender system in particular, uh, but much of what I say will hold for any music recommendation system that implements personalization. Okay, so personalization and the listening subject. So as Georgina and Fernando observe, um, personalization based recommender systems, they set, typically set out to model you and your preferences as being apt to change with context, um, being apt to kind of update according to whatever context you're in. And up to a point, you know, this is a good thing, right? Because our preferences do change over time and according to context, and you know, arguably they should. Our preferences are formed in community with others and so on, right? But as uh, R Robert Prey points out, um, Spotify's recommender system radically overshoots the runway on this front because what it ends up actually modeling um, when it's modeling you is just this kind of chaotic, ever-changing bundle of knee-jerk desires, right? And then that, that kind of chaotic bundle gets arbitrarily associated with you via you know, your account number or your IP address or whatever, right? Um, so you know, from, its from the perspective of the recommender system, what you are is just this cloud of potentially wildly inconsistent desires that is apt to completely change its nature at any moment. 
Um, so as uh, Robert Prey puts it, there is no real subject to be represented. I am an urban travel enthusiast with a penchant for the Delta blues until I am not. You are a suburban lover of smooth jazz until you are not. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this when you're, you know, you're you kind of have a particularly eclectic week of music listening and then your Discover Weekly is just all over the place the following week and the system is kind of going, oh man, you know. Um, so effectively, I think Spotify's recommender system, it effectively sees you as, as something like this. It sees you as this, you know, perfectly capricious subject with these evanescent whims who has to be propitiated with constant treats. Um, it sees you as a subject that has no concern for any value apart from your own immediate desires. It sees you as a subject as well, all of whose musical likes are on a par, right? So from the perspective of one of these systems, you know, all that there is to liking a piece of music is for it to satisfy a potentially momentary preference on your part. Like that's, that's what it is to like a piece of music. But of course, the, the problem with this model of the listening subject is that it is inaccurate, to say the least. So for one thing, all musical likes are not on a par, right? There's a big difference between merely liking a piece of music in the sense of, you know, taking it to satisfy an urge of the moment and liking it in the sense of thinking it's a really great piece of music. Um, you know, whatever that latter category is for you, whether it's Nirvana or whether it's Mahler or, you know, Hindustani classical music, whatever, there's more to, there's more to liking music sometimes than just taking it to satisfy some whim of yours. And this latter kind of liking involves taking music to um, have a value that doesn't just concern you, it concerns everybody, right? It's to see that music, that piece of music as meriting appreciation as being the kind of thing that deserves to have a community of admirers. Um, and this, what I'm talking about now, is this distinctively normative dimension of aesthetic experience. Um, so this is the dimension of aesthetic experience, the fact that we, you know, when we make a genuine aesthetic judgment, we take it that everybody ought to feel this way. Even if they don't, they're making a mistake. Like, this is great, why don't you like it? This normative dimension of aesthetic experience is something that philosophers have acknowledged as are probably the most distinctive aspect of aesthetic experience, at least since Kant's critique of judgment. Um, and it's, you know, it's what makes aesthetic experience more than mere liking. And according to Kant, at least, it's what makes aesthetic judgment occupy this really distinctive place in human cognition at large. But as Georgina and Fernando note, current recommender systems um, basically efface the normative dimension of aesthetic experience entirely. It's invisible to them, right? Um, the only kind of value that personalization acknowledges is value that's internal to the listener herself. It doesn't acknowledge that listeners are in fact sensitive to sources of value that lie outside themselves and that are shared by others, that concern others as well. And it also uh, doesn't acknowledge the fact that our tastes don't merely change, you know, they ideally, at least, they develop, they grow, they go in a direction. There's continuity over time, even if there is change. And we actually want them to do this too. We want them to, to develop. So for another thing, the other, you know, another kind of related problem with this model of the listening subject uh, is that, you know, we are not in fact just chaotic bundles of momentary desires that are apt to change entirely from moment to moment because we have deeper desires and emotions too that are much more enduring, much less context sensitive, and that have much more to do with who we really are at heart. And it's these desires and emotions that are engaged by the music that really moves us. So Martha Nussbaum in her 2012 book, Upheavals of Thought, argues that all of us have these forceful emotions that are not conceptual in the way that they would have to be if we were to be able to articulate them. Um, so they're kind of like, you know, apt to elude the machinery of discursive thought. And in many cases, these powerful emotions are ones that have shaped our lives since childhood and are really fundamental to our personalities. And Nussbaum argues that music, since it can kind of bypass all the machinery of discursive thought, is especially well suited to like latch on to these uh, chaotic inchoate emotions and bring them to the surface for us to discover perhaps for the first time. You know, you can have these experiences of like, having yourself revealed to yourself through music. But now a system can hardly connect us with the music that speaks to us deep down 
if from its perspective, we don't have a deep down to be spoken to in the first place. So it either won't connect us with that music at all, or it'll do it purely by accident. And so the more we all, again, you know, this is something that Georgina and Fernando stress, we have to think about the cumulative effect, effects of this. So the more that all of us rely over time in, across populations on personalization based systems to deliver music to us, we all run a risk there of failing to connect with the music that actually really matters to us and also of forfeiting the kind of self-revelation to which music can actually conduce. So, as I said, music can conduce to a powerful kind of self-understanding. But this isn't the only kind of epistemic value that music has, because it can conduce to understanding others as well. Um, so when you're, you know, when you're listening to music with somebody, whether it's a performer, whether it's another audience member, and you see that they're moved as you are, you discover in that moment that at some sort of wordless level, this person is like you. They must be because this music speaks to and about them at this fundamental, hard to articulate level, just as it speaks to and about you. And this discovery of likeness, this kind of fundamental likeness can foster a potent sense of affinity, which can bypass all the other differences between you that might obtain age, race, class, gender, and so on. And it can foster, in particular, the uh, mutual recognition, which, you know, something that is crucial for Hegel, at least, and, and for the philosophers that follow him, for the development not just of self-consciousness, but of the collective political consciousness of a society. So for Hegel, mutual recognition is kind of like the spark that you need to grow up, basically, you know, both as an individual and as a society. Um, and music can actually, collective experiences of music can actually foster this sort of uh, mutual recognition. And so this means that expressive music has serious socio-political socio power. I mean, again, to stress, like, obviously, listening to music just doesn't just automatically confer this. It gives you the opportunity to benefit from this kind of power, but you have to do some work for it. But music does have enormous socio-political power. It can foster cultural citizenship in particular, as Georgina was talking, at the, talking about at the start, because music can create these spheres of communal engagement into which diverse citizens can enter freely and willingly, right? So they're, they're not forced to go in uh, and in which they find themselves motivated to actually regard each other um, with the respect required if they are to engage in the kinds of reciprocal relations that are required of them elsewhere in the political community. Um, and it was for these reasons that the romantic philosophers so, you know, the Schlegel brothers, the Schleiermacher, Novalis, people like that, uh, thought that music alongside the other arts uh, was a crucial component of the ideal political system. An idea, by the way, which is com coming back now in the last 20 years or so with uh, talk about cultural democracy. Um, and, you know, music recommendation then can be a powerful amplifier for the socio-political socio power of music and thereby for cultural citizenship because my ability to see my fellow citizens as being like me, as deserving of my respect, can be enhanced by my being exposed to the music that matters to them and vice versa. And even more so if we can all experience each other's music together collectively, as Georgina was arguing earlier. But now the only rationale that a personalization based recommender system uses when it's deciding what to present you with is just whether you're likely to like that piece of music based on what it reckons you like. The system won't ever present you with a piece of music simply because it's worth listening to, you know, for that reason alone. It won't ever, this is echoing the point that I made earlier about recommender systems flattening out the aesthetic dimension, or sorry, the normative dimension of aesthetic experience. Um, so for example, like a recommender system won't ever present you with music that's significant for your culture for that reason alone. It won't ever uh, present you with music from a culture that you spare, share space with in your city for that reason alone. It won't ever present you with, uh, you know, an album by an independent songwriter who lives on your street for that, for that reason alone. This is all work music. This is all music that is worth your listening to, though, independently of whether you're likely to like it at first pass. It has value that's not just a function of your desires. But those kinds of rep recommendations are invisible to a system that is blind to cultural value that only cares about whether uh, a given piece of music is likely to satisfy your kind of knee-jerk first order desires. So as long as hyper-personalization rules the roost, um, where recommender systems go, the amplification of music's socio-political power either won't happen through musical recommendation or it'll happen purely by accident. 
Now, more generally too, music can only foster cultural citizenship if we see ourselves and each other as listeners that have deep desires and emotions to which we want music to speak. We see ourselves and others as listeners that are sensitive to sources of value outside ourselves. By the way, this is the kind of listener we in fact are already, right? We have to, but we have to understand ourselves in this way to benefit from music's power to foster cultural citizenship. And in addition, um, we have to be acknowledged as such by whatever entities are recommending music to us. These, like this has to be in place if music can foster cultural citizenship. But right now, recommender systems don't see us this way. And they're also tacitly encouraging us not to see ourselves that way either. And so the real danger of personalization is cumulative, right? As Georgina and Fernando argue, it's one that manifests over time at the societal level. Because if musical listeners were to actually become what they already are in the eyes of personalization, right? If we were all just to become these chaotic bundles of first order musical desires, then this would be a world in which music would be at risk of losing its deep connection to our emotional lives and with it, it, with it its socio-political resonance as well. And this world I think would be greatly impoverished. So thanks.